In this installment of the After the Collapse series, we continue our discussion of the Great Plains and how they might fare in the case of a prolonged nationwide or global grid down scenario. So let's get to it. You can show your support for the After the Clap series by liking, commenting, and sharing this video on other social media platforms. Enjoy the video. The Canadian prairies. For seven months out of the year, this is a cold and barren landscape, only survivable because of the infrastructure and amenities of modern civilization. In the first part of this installment of the After the Clap series, we discuss factors relating to the environment and to the availability of resources. In this video, we are going to continue looking at some of the topographical features of the Canadian prairie and how they might affect grid down human relations. We will talk about personal security and other risk factors, as well as demographics and some protective factors of this region. In the case of a prolonged collapse of civilization as we know it, next to the Arctic and the Rocky Mountains, the Great Plains would have to be one of the most arduous environments to try to subsist. In the Great Plains, there is no shelter. You are fully exposed. The brisk winter winds will freeze exposed skin in seconds. In the exceptionally warm and humid summer, can leave you incapacitated. There are many other threats besides the scarcity of resources which are going to be a factor in this environment. As mentioned previously, insects are going to be a problem everywhere in Canada and Saskatchewan and Manitoba are absolutely no exception. The bugs will absolutely drive you nuts. I would advise you, if you were a prepper or a survivalist, to stock up on as much DEET or as much bug deterrence that are going to last a long time as you can. Because this factor alone may be what drives a lot of people to make very stupid decisions. Bugs may seem like just a nuisance, but when you're trying to cut wood and you're swatting bugs at the same time, accidents can happen, which could lead to your death. To give you an understanding of how bad the bugs are in Canada, it's not uncommon for the large game of the north, like moose, deer, and elk, to be driven completely insane and seek refuge in the lakes and rivers from this pestilence that plagues the Canadian wilderness. In the prairie regions in the grasslands, wood ticks are going to be an absolute nightmare for many people. In the springtime, you cannot spend a night under the stars in southern Saskatchewan without being overrun by wood ticks. This is going to drive a lot of people insane between the months of April and early July. Fortunately, in the hot summer months, ticks usually go away. Although they can be easily picked off, they are an incredible nuisance parasite, which will certainly wear on a person psychologically. If it wasn't for the Arctic, northern Manitoba would have to be one of the most inaccessible places on Earth. Northern Manitoba provides the habitat for nearly 1,000 polar bears, the largest carnivore on Earth. This is a considerable amount considering there's only an estimated 30,000 worldwide. It's very unlikely that anybody without the modern means of transportation would be able to bug out this far into the Canadian wilderness. The only place of refuge in northern Manitoba would have to be Churchill. This is a great place to go to be consumed by polar bears. This is probably as remote a community as it gets without going up into the Northwest Territories in the Yukon. Within this region and many others in Canada, including the Cypress Hills, there are forts that were once used by the fur traders in the colonizing Canadian government. The majority of the population in Churchill are Aboriginal. Thus many of these individuals may still have the skills required to live off the land. But the primary source of the economy in this region is tourism. Thus, this would not be an ideal place to bug out to, and is the literal end of the line when it comes to venturing north into the Hudson Bay region. Manitoba and Saskatchewan have some of the most abundantly clean sources of freshwater fish on Earth. With hundreds of thousands of lakes in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, an avid angler with shelter and security will have no problem subsisting in this region. 
There are numerous other potential environmental hazards within this region. As discussed before, forest fires are a problem across Canada. The prairie provinces also fall within Tornado Alley. This is a region which spans the American Midwest and parts of the prairie provinces in which tornadoes are very common. Numerous devastating F5 tornadoes have been recorded across Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Although these are rare meteorological events, if they were to happen, there would be no emergency response in place to assist people in need. Flash flooding and intense electrical storms are also quite typical within this region. The heightened risk of flooding is in part due to the fact that much of Manitoba and Saskatchewan is comprised of wetlands. And the province of Manitoba alone has the 10th largest supply of fresh water on planet Earth. In spite of the fact that these provinces are home to hundreds of thousands of lakes and some of the largest fresh water supplies on the planet, drought is still not uncommon here. When coupled with strong winds in the summer months, this creates ripe conditions for forest fires. In 2015, in the northern part of Saskatchewan and Alberta, record-breaking forest fires inundated the province with smoke. These fires were so intense that the smoke and ash from them blanketed a significant portion of the American Midwest, all the way down to Texas. Numerous air quality warnings had to be issued for several weeks while these fires raged on. Even with modern firefighting technology and help from other provinces and American emergency response teams, firefighters' efforts were mostly in vain and were at the whim of the rains that eventually came and put these fires out. Now the flat topography of the prairie provinces has its benefits and of course drawbacks when it comes to navigating a shit hits the fan scenario. One of the main benefits is going to be the ease of travel and the abundance of grid roads. These grid roads will allow for unobstructed travel across most parts of the province. With very few obstructions aside tall grass, travel by foot, horseback, all-terrain vehicle, or sport utility vehicle is very achievable. This is one of the few stretches in Canada where you can truly go off-road with your off-road vehicle. In other places, the foothills, the mountains, and the trees of the boreal forest will not allow you to do that. Another benefit of this region that's worth repeating is the low population density. The overwhelming majority of the Canadian population is around the Great Lakes region. The distance traveled under the best of conditions to the Prairie Provinces in a vehicle going 100 kilometers an hour from the Great Lakes region can take upwards of 25 hours. It's equidistant to the densely populated west coast. For this reason, security threats posed by people will be at a minimum within this region. However, that is all dependent upon how scarce resources get. Now, a significantly higher proportion of Canadian gun owners live within these three provinces. In fact, while these three provinces collectively form about one-eighth of the Canadian population, one quarter of the firearms can be found here, making for significantly above average gun ownership. This is due to the largely above average rural population. A person would be naive to think that there are no human threats in this region, as there are plenty of people in this region who know how to use firearms and are very familiar with the backwoods that they inhabit. Many of the people out here also have a general knowledge of agriculture. However, due to the corporatization and the decline of the family farm, most people in recent generations have moved to more urban environments. But many can still recount stories of hunting with their elders when they were younger and helping out around the farm. While the relative lack of obstructions in the prairie landscape make for ease of travel in a post-collapse environment, the lack of concealment does pose a security risk. For example, imagine you were trying to go unnoticed or evade capture in a forested region. The opportunities to elude your pursuers would be numerous, and you could easily lose yourself in the wilderness. This is not the case in the prairie landscape, where an uncamouflaged moving object can be identified miles away. Because the harsh winter climate necessitates that you have an ongoing fire to keep yourself warm, the inability to conceal your presence is going to pose a major security risk. You won't have the luxury of being able to barricade a few roads to bottleneck or prevent intruders from entering. The wide open landscape leaves you open to attack in all directions. Conversely, this can also work to your advantage as it means you can see an attack coming on all sides and have many possibilities for escape. This is the geographical security strategy that is employed at Fort Knox, in which the land surrounding Fort Knox is wide open, leaving less potential for stealthy ambush. 
Alternative ways to commute are through the various river systems that run across the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. The Saskatchewan rivers run all the way from the glaciers thousands of miles into Lake Winnipeg and then into Hudson Bay. Under the right conditions, one could traverse thousands of kilometers with minimal energy expenditure just utilizing the current of the rivers. Other major geographical landmarks are systems like the Quapel Valley in Saskatchewan. This is a massive valley about 2 kilometers wide and 430 kilometers long. Throughout this valley are lakes, rivers, coulees, and other undisturbed grasslands, which may provide the basic resources needed for sustenance and survival. The Cypress Hills in lower southern Saskatchewan provide a temporary escape from the flatlands. Within this region, you'll find the highest elevations of the prairies and the most varied elevational terrain. This is generally a warmer part of the province with abundant wild game, significant concealment and shelter possibilities due to the fact that it's forested, and as the name denotes, it's a very hilly region. The midpoint of the Great Plains is probably the farthest you can get from a nuclear reactor on the continent of North America. Thus, were the grid to ever go down, you would at least be spared the immediate effects of nuclear meltdowns. In addition, besides Winnipeg, Calgary, and Edmonton, most of the prairies would be spared a direct hit with a nuclear weapon if there was ever an atomic exchange. Winnipeg is the geographical center of Canada, and thus it's a prime hub for transport from the United States to Canada. Considering Saskatchewan has the largest deposits of uranium on Earth, it's likely to be an area of geopolitical interest in the case of any global conflict. Within the urban areas in any Canadian province, it's important that you're cognizant of national or international organizations. For example, the RCMP have their training barracks in Regina and the International Vaccine Center is in Saskatoon. There's also militia outposts throughout the province. Depending on the type of disaster that affects a certain region, these organizations may be activated. The type of disaster, of course, is going to determine whether or not you want to avoid these institutions or seek them out for support. Now, the demographics of the prairie landscape are probably among the least diverse when it comes to visible minorities and are comprised of populations which are largely Ukrainian and German. Some of the lowest percentages in Canada of foreign-born residents reside in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Consider that around 26% of Ontario is foreign-born compared to just 5 and 12% in Saskatchewan and Manitoba respectively. However, it should be stated that the largest populations of Aboriginal, First Nations and Métis people reside within this region. Over 600,000 Aboriginal and Métis people live across these three provinces. This is significant considering there are only 1.4 million Aboriginal and Métis people in Canada as a whole. This means that Aboriginal and Métis representation is three to four times that of the national average within these three provinces. While this Aboriginal diversity has lent itself to the affinity that most Western Canadians share with the land. It was the Aboriginal people's knowledge of living off the land that assisted the original European pioneers to get situated before quote-unquote breaking the land and shifting the subsistence pattern from one that was nomadic to one that was horticulture based. Many of these Aboriginal people, particularly in the northern or more remote climates, still possess this affinity that they once had with the land, especially the older generations who still speak their native tongues. However, much of the culture has been diluted as Aboriginals have integrated into the urban lifestyle. Because of the extensive history of colonialism and forced integration within this region, many racial rifts still exist today. Racial tensions between people of Aboriginal and European descent will be problematic post-collapse as they are problematic today. Among all of the Canadian provinces, the Prairie provinces are among the most notorious for racial divisions and conflict. While much of this tension can be attributed to the general struggles of post-colonial integration, although less a factor today, there was historically much tension between the Métis and the Canadian government. The Métis people were basically a mixture of people of First Nations or Native American descent and the French voyageurs who traversed westward during the fur trade which preceded the Confederation of Canada by several hundred years. 
For nearly 250 years between the 17th and 19th century, the fur trade was what put Canada on the map, and it was the French voyageurs who charted a course through the Canadian landscape and began trade routes and ultimately intermixed with the Aboriginal groups that they encountered. Now historically, in the early 19th century, the Métis people were in conflict with the Canadian government and what was known as the Hudson Bay Company, which was the primary fur trading company that claimed ownership rights to the land that the Métis had lived on. The Hudson Bay Company wanted to settle the region which is now known as Winnipeg with Scottish settlers. This led to intense conflict, the clash between the Métis and the powers that be in the Red River Rebellion and the Northwest Rebellion should give you a sense of the historical rift between these populations of people. By some, Louis Riel is a champion of personal rights and freedoms, a martyr for the rights of self-determination against tyrannical governments. For others, he was considered a traitor to Canadian Federation. It's very easy to see how Gabriel Dumont and Louis Riel's resistance is sympathized with by Americans, who themselves were victorious in their fight for sovereignty from the British Empire. Although the overwhelming majority of people today of First Nations, Métis and European descent live amongst each other peacefully, one would be remiss to deny that there wasn't still racial tension which may end up being a factor post-collapse. However, for every indignant or bigoted person on either side of the debate, there is the overwhelming majority of people who I think are going to look past these differences and when it comes down to survival, segregation along these racial lines may not be very practical. Now the Aboriginal people who are either themselves or descendants of those who were forcefully removed from the land and injected into the urban environments are much more likely today to struggle with poverty and addictions. This means that many of them are accustomed to living a life of adversity and hardship, a credential that those who live in the relative comfort and luxury of the suburbs cannot claim for themselves. It is this acclimation to hardship and the street sense that accompanies it that may put many of these Aboriginal people at a significant advantage in a shit hits the fan situation where society has broken down and resources are scarce it's arguably going to be much easier for those who are in poverty now to adapt to a grid down scenario which would in some way see people deprived of their basic needs will more easily adapt to this chaotic environment than those who quite frankly have more to lose. Furthermore, it's inherent in most North American Aboriginal cultures the lack of emphasis on possessiveness, consumerism, and selfishness. Many of the Aboriginal people I've known have been much more communally focused in nature, more concerned with living under the radar at a subsistence level than being motivated by things like pride and greed. Now within the inner cities of the Prairie Provinces you have some of the highest crime rates in Canada. A lot of this is internal crime within the Aboriginal population. A lot of it is gang related on a street gang level. However, I don't believe that many of these gangs are going to be a significant factor post-collapse, namely because they're mostly street-level gangs. The creation of many of these gangs came about because some of the motorcycle gangs at one point needed some sort of buffer between themselves and law enforcement. So in trafficking various black market products to the streets, they needed people to distribute and micromanage this situation. This led to the emergence of numerous Aboriginal street gangs. Participation in these street gangs number in the thousands across the Three Prairie Provinces, and although very loosely connected, will certainly be a factor post-collapse. Now, throughout the Prairie Provinces, there are enclaves of Hutterite colonies, which although less alienated than Amish communities, and not as traditionalist in terms of the technology they used, these communities still are very exclusive and tight-knit and certainly would have a much better chance of surviving a collapse scenario simply because most of them have a head start living largely in rural or agrarian based communities that tend to distance themselves from major urban centers. One good thing about the prairies is that there's not a lot of extremist views, either political or religious. Well, for the better part of the 20th century, it was a very socialist province Currently, there is a conservative government in power, and most people tend to be very moderate in their views. While the population is predominantly Christian, aside a few sects of the religion that either isolate themselves or proselytize to others, fundamentalism, radicalism, and extremism 
are far removed from the Canadian prairies. Stay tuned for the next installment of the After the Collapse series where we venture into the Canadian Shield, into North Ontario and the Great Lakes region which is certain to be a flashpoint for all manner of Teotihuacan chaos in a grid down situation. Don't forget that it's viewers like yourself who make these videos possible by showing your support in liking, commenting, subscribing and if you are so inclined you can make a small donation via the link on my YouTube channel's main page. All the donations I receive on these After the Collapse videos are reinvested into the series down the line. Thanks for watching Canadian Prepper Out.